hard here. It is day three of a very long weekend for some of us. Uh, as you have heard, I hope we had our first in person, this Pacific Southwest region of the Christian Church Regional Assembly for four, it's been four years since we've had an assembly together in the same space. So um, Friday and Saturday and uh, Mary Jane, I tell you how many hats I was wearing. So I'm so grateful to be able to be here this morning with you all, uh, knowing that we are gathering in worship this morning in communion with disciples churches across Southern California and Las Vegas and Hawaii. And of course, far beyond that as well. But this weekend, we do give thanks for our regional church family. I want to thank you for your donations to our food drive this morning. Thank you always for that. Thank you to Eliseo and thank you to Ray, uh, who got us started with that. Eliseo, who often does our deliveries. I'm guessing most of you in this room have signed up for Trunk or Treat if you were going to do that. But if you haven't, the clipboard with the sign up, it's two pages long. Cards are on the second page. It is on that little table in Bailey Hall if you need to visit it before you leave today. So this Wednesday is Lunch Bunch. Raise your hand if your name is Ray or Vicki Adsit. Those are the Adsits. Those are the people that want to know if you are coming to Lunch Bunch on Wednesday at Olive Garden so they can make the appropriate reservation. So I believe that is all I need to announce, but there are a number of other things on this calendar, so I encourage you to take a look at that. I have one birthday but he's in Missouri, so I, how loud can we sing this morning, y'all? Should we, Bob, Bob Neely's birthday is on Saturday. Let's, let's just sing so we can tell him we did. How about that? Does that work? Sure. So, uh, do you have a song that we should sing? Okay, let's do that. <laughs> to worship God, to reconcile ourselves one to another. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us glance at our neighbors with eyes of peace this morning. Yes, amen and amen. I invite you to stand now as you are able and join me in singing our gathering song number six, Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above. Which is both printed in your bulletin and on the screens. 
Friends, we gather again today to praise God's name and ask God's blessing. God has been waiting to welcome us in. We are easily distracted and too often forget how pleased God is when we turn our attention toward Christ's gospel of compassion and mercy. Jesus invites us into faithfulness, promising that our perseverance will bear fruit, though we may feel that we have waited long on God's deliverance, we confess that our part in the Holy Covenant has often faltered and faded from view. Let us pray and give thanks without ceasing. May our congregation be a beacon of eternal hope and love. May our faith be renewed this day by the power of the Holy Spirit working in our midst. Let us worship God with thankful, joyful hearts. And now join me in this opening prayer prepared for us by our worship leader, Bob Neely. Father, in these days with all that is going on in our world, it would be so easy to just give up. However, with your help, we learn to become persistent, to pray all the time, to keep going after that which we know is right and best. It may take some time. But if we are persistent with your help, we will win in the end. Amen. Please be seated. in the middle back. Any idea? Um, um.
Oh, my friends, let's see. I feel like there are some people who are so very small today, I can't even see them. But I trust. Wait, is there just one? Oh, I see one. <gasps> there we go. Good morning. Good morning, Tennyson. God loves you, Tennyson. Good morning, Jenny. God loves you, James. And who do we have on Zoom this morning, Karen? Well, let me turn the camera back, and then I can tell you. All right. All Hello, right. Zoomers. Yes. Except for it won't stay. I there we go. You. All right. So who do we have? We have Kathy Mulligan. Kathy Mulligan. Amy Cliff. She's loud. Amy Cliff. Betty Sullivan. Betty. Jenny Angioni. Jenny. And Michael Martin. And Michael Martin. All right. Good morning, Zoomers. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. They, they told me the other day, they're always saying good morning when, yes. when we say that to them. I so. saw their mouths move. Oh, <laughs> their mouths are moving. All right. Let's say it together. God loves you, Zoomers. Very good. All right. Let us move into a time of prayer as we share the joys and concerns of this community and beyond. I do want to lift up the great joy of our wonderful regional assembly this weekend in Fullerton. So many people worked very hard. Uh, there were, you know, hiccups because we hadn't done it in a while and we didn't completely remember all the little things that we normally do, but the ch church was the church and the church did church. Uh, I rejoice to say that the church uh, passed a resolution rejecting Christian nationalism um, so that we were prophetic in the midst of these difficult times. Uh, there was much preaching, there was much teaching. I'm just kind of still wired, so yay! God with joyful hearts, we give you many thanks. thanks. Mary Jane, do you want to add anything? Together, she's saying, in case our Zoomers aren't quite catching that. So, yes, thank you. Let's see some other good news. Brenda, I'm going to share your good news. You're still happy about it, right? All right. Brenda got some great news, two great newses this week. Uh, she got results of her PET scan that she had the week before, which showed that the tumor shrunk. So, that is awesome. But also, uh, she, because of that and having lost some weight, her doctor says she is now a candidate for surgery, which is a fantastic milestone. Um, yeah. Did not really expect that to become a possibility. No. So this is- I go from stage four cancer to no cancer in one day. Uh, all right then. So yes, so she is uh, right now in the process of, uh, you know, getting referrals to surgeons yeah. and blah, blah, blah. So it probably won't be tomorrow, uh, but we do give thanks with Brenda for that uh, great uh, progress. God with joyful hearts. We are uh, sharing our prayers of sympathy this week with Troy Gerling and his family. They've got the flowers for us this week in memory of Troy's uncle. Uh, this is the brother of his mom, not any of the Gerlings that we know. His uncle, Michael Kimball, who passed away on the 17th of September. So we surround that family with our prayers. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Uh, John and Jennifer are here, which is fantastic. Uh, but they might not have been because their daughter, Jamie, who was with them last weekend, uh, came down with COVID after that uh, gathering. So we're glad that you all, I'm assuming you're well, right? That's why you're here. Okay, I forgot to check in. Um, is, and is Jamie still the only one in the house? Yes, okay. So we pray for Jamie. Jamie, because of some other conditions that she has, is not able to take the medicines that some folks would take to make it go away faster. So I'm um, just waiting for it to run its course. Uh, so prayers for Jamie and the family and mom and dad. God, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayers. We're praying with uh, Mary Jane, whose uh, sister Leanne, um, as you know, she's uh, in, living in Maine, is developmentally disabled. She's younger or older sister? Nine years younger, all right. Um, and she has been having a lot of trouble aspirating her food. And she's been in the hospital for well over a week now. And they have finally made the difficult decision to put in a feeding tube 
so that she can, can get nourishment uh, without all that complication that has been causing her great anxiety. So prayers for that process. It hasn't happened yet, right? Is it t tomorrow? So prayers for that process for uh, Mary Jane's sister, Leanne. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Uh, we are praying uh, for Patrice Hill, who is very sick again slash still with respiratory stuff, um, body aches, cold, flu, not clear. Um, Patrice is also uh, struggling financially, so trying to take care of herself being ill and also uh, Trinity, who is living with her doing her last year in high school. So prayers for Sister Patrice. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Becky Neely uh, is praying for good results. She got a biopsy done um, up on her head where she had had skin cancer removed previously. They're afraid it's back, so prayers that it's not or that it can be uh, removed as easily as possible. She did uh, have an okay appointment also with a podiatrist. Um, the ligaments on one of her feet are basically shot, but not to the point that they're going to do surgery. So. Uh, prayers for Becky with that and she and Bob are also both uh, continuing to have stomach problems and are going to see some doctors for that next month. So prayers for Becky and Bob. God in your mercy. Amen. Hear our prayers. Praying as always. Is there anything in there from Betty? I don't have any updates but no update. I just think we're always praying for Betty and her girls Cheryl and Pam and her niece Kim. So prayers for all of the family. God in your mercy. Amen. Hear our prayers. We have prayer requests uh, from Becca Mori um, for a Marine she knows from when she worked up at uh, MCRD, a uh, young man named Harrison, uh, who had great tragedy. His uh, wife, who was six months pregnant, was killed in a car crash yesterday. Uh, their three-year-old daughter was also in the car and was literally saved by her car seat, but is also in the hospital in, in critical condition. So um, just can't even imagine the impact of all of that loss and trauma. Uh, so prayers for Harrison and Ava and all of the family. God, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayers. We pray for all those impacted by gun violence across our country this week. We know in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, there has been great uh, trauma also in uh, Central California as well. Uh, many, many places that we know of. God, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayers. And we continue to lift up uh, the women and other protesters in Iran, especially with a, a fire at one of the prisons where they are keeping political prisoners. Um, so all of those folks and, and all those living and struggling under oppressive regimes around the world. God, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayers. Uh, we lift up our ministry partners each week. Our global ministries prayer partner this week is Korea where Lydia Yang is our mission co-worker. Lydia is actually, as Susan Dewey always used to say, a fine product of the Pacific Southwest region. So Lydia is, is one of ours. So prayers for her and her work in Korea. Um, our Pacific Southwest regional prayer partner this week is Loving Jesus Church in Pasadena, where Joseph Ahn is the pastor. So we pray for these and all of our partners in ministry. God, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayers. Are there prayers from Zoom? Not today. All Zoom right. is quiet. Not yet. All is quiet on the Zoom front. I think Tracy's making hand motions. Yeah. Um, we have a joy in our family. This should have been brought up three weeks ago. I don't know why it wasn't. But um, my parents are great grandparents again. My niece gave birth to um, a little boy on September 26th. Brody James is his name. He was eight pounds, one ounce, uh, 20 and a quarter inches long. All right, so we rejoice with Tracy and with, say the name again? Brody James. Brody James. I was going to get it backwards. So prayers of thanksgiving and oohs and ahs and coos and all the things. God with joyful hearts, yes. we give you thanks. Are you, yes. Oh, sorry. Jerry, yes. Uh, Norma's at home enjoying a visit with her sister. She sees her if she's lucky once a year. Okay. And, uh, this is a good week for her. Yes. What is what is sister's name? Christine. Chris, Christine? Christine. Christine. All right. So we give thanks with Norma, who is home visiting with her sister from... Yakima, Washington. Yeah, I thought it was Washington. Yes, from Yakima. So uh, prayers for that visit. God with joyful hearts. We give you thanks. Tim? I've got a prayer concern for Hannah here. He lost his voice. 
going to that horrible seventh inning last night. Oh. He was there at the stadium. <laughs> when we beat LA, and I tell you what, my mom was just feeling so uh, old through the day, and then we all gathered for that game, and man, she was jumping up and down. The night before, at like 10 p.m., she made it a point. I'm calling Robert Neely, and they had a good conversation at the Padres, really did it to Los Angeles. I even heard from Dick Bailey last night, who gifted us that gorgeous grand piano. What a time to just bond together around San Diego family. Uh, and we really are sorry that you had to be at that seventh inning. I'm not, I'm not sure which, I, I guess we're doing both here. So prayers for Hanum's voice. God in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayers. And lo, there was much rejoicing. So uh, I, we were actually, I was having dinner Friday night with Julie and Mandy, Mandy wearing her Padres gear out in public in Fullerton. So there were some fans of something. It turned out they were Angels fans, so they were on our side. So um, it worked out well. So uh, we will just give thanks for celebration. God with joyful hearts, we give you thanks. Um, I, prayers for Katie. I was uh, texting with her last night. And there's just, just some family things to, to, to pray for. Yes. And also I know it's just an animal, but it's my dog. And they uh, had some wrong things prescribed to her, so they're changing it. And also she has to have a, a test for a thing that they want to see if it's cancer. So it's okay, well, remind us of your puppy's name? Lola. Lola, yes. Okay, so prayers for Katie Yoder, who is, is going through family drama that we pray her through every time. God, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayers. And prayers for Deborah and her dog Lola who are uh, getting prescriptions adjusted and, and will be being tested for cancer. So very hard times there. God, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayers. Please? I have to, oh, is, is there on? a green light? Yeah. Yes, it's on. Just oh. hold it, yes. I feel like we have weird dead spots today, so. I agree. I think it looks a little bit better when I do this. Yes. Um, some personal prayers and kind of a, a large concern. So concern first. I don't know if any of you guys heard about the merger where the silver companies is buying up Albertsons and Vons. And in some parts of the country, it's not that much. Kroger has reach and some Albertsons has reach in the other. But in Southern California and San Diego specifically, um, there is some real turmoil going on. I don't know if you guys remember the strike from 2005 um, when it was just terrible, terrible, and then the almost strike earlier this year. But the fact of the matter is that 350 stores are going to close um, in Southern California. If you count Santa Barbara down, and here in San Diego, we are going to be seriously affected. They say that they don't expect point-of-sale retail stores to close, that the consolidations will be administrative and logistical. I don't buy it. And so one of the things that, that, I, that I'm concerned about is the union itself is going to be able to take care of the workers that are going to have some and also for people, consolidation usually doesn't lower prices, it raises revenue. So people are already paying for the work. Uh, particularly in places, frankly, that Albertsons and Bonds and Routes and Food for Less don't even reach. Mm -hmm. But rising boats in those places are going to be rising boats in places like Buffalo and Logan, um, Mountain View, and all those other places. So food insecurity is going to be bigger across the county. And so prayers for that. We might do some of that in terms of people coming to Welcome Saturday. So yes. just prayers for that. Yes. And personal joys. Um, two of my staff made some major transitions. One of them went from Virginia to Jacksonville. Um, her husband is an officer in the Navy, and they bought a house first time. And they plan on planting roots in, in there. And uh, I'm excited for them and plan on going to Jacksonville, <laughs> where I spent some time shortly after my birth. I don't remember. But I spent some time shortly after my birth. And also, um, Christina Sonis, whose son is on the autism spectrum and has some behavioral issues. He's in his 20s. We got into a culinary program up in Washington State where they are working with him. They are managing his outbursts. And she went up there with her husband from Palo Alto, and they had dinner there. Oh, wow. And he was, you know, he's not even cooking yet. He's just watching the show. But he was bursting with pride. Wonderful. What is his name, Lace? Um, I what they is call him Bubba. Bubba, so, okay. Bubba Sonas. God, God, knows, God knows who we're talking about.
happy about it. God knows so, we were talking yeah. about. Just that he complete the program, that they're gonna continue working with them, that the behaviors they manage. Oliver Christina is so pleased. Yeah. He has not left home ever. Wow. And this is the very first time. Wonderful. Wonderful. So we do lift up our prayers of concern for all those who will be impacted by the grocery store merger, um, doors potentially closing, people losing jobs, prices going up, for all those who will be impacted by that. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We give thanks for uh, Lisa's friends and co-workers who have moved and bought a new house and are putting down roots, and for the family whose, whose son who has struggled has found a, a wonderful new place to grow and be. God, with joyful hearts, we give you thanks. Let us continue in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we come to you on this day as we do every day, God. We come to you with hearts that are so full, that are often distracted, and forget that you are the one we can turn to with whatever it is, God, with all of the things, with our pain and suffering, with our thanksgiving, our joy, with our confusion and our frustration, O oh God, we come to you this day, laying it all down at your feet. We come to you praying and praying and praying. We ask that you will send us forth from this place, praying and praying and praying, turning to you in every moment, O oh God. We lift up this church to you, asking that you would again remake us, reform us as your people, Guide us and direct us. Send us forth from these walls to be a creative and joyful sense of hope, a beacon of hope, God, for our community. We pray your blessing for those you are preparing even now to join with us in this family of faith. We pray for those who are struggling, those who are hurting in their bodies or their hearts or their minds, oh God. We pray for those who are struggling to make ends meet, for those who aren't sure what tomorrow will bring and how they will survive it. We pray, O oh God, for our neighbors living without shelter, for immigrants and refugees and asylum seekers in our midst and around the world, O oh God. We pray this day for children, for our children, for your children, for children all around the world, those who are in danger, those who are on the run, those who are threatened by violence and disaster. We pray for elders, O oh God, for all those who are living but just barely, O oh God, those who are lonely, those who are isolated, we pray that you would teach us how to see one another, how to reach out with arms and hands of love. We pray, O oh God, for all those in our midst as we try to rebuild our lives, O oh God, for our schools and our healthcare workers and everyone who helps us, shows us how to care for one another. We pray this day for the blessing of hope, O oh God, we ask that you would help us to be faithful, help us to be persistent, help us to return to you again and again. We pray this day giving thanks for our regional church, for our regional minister, Richie Sanchez, for all of the staff and all of our partner churches and ministries around this region and beyond, we pray, oh God, giving thanks for the special blessing that is the Christian church, disciples of Christ, trying to be your people and nothing else, oh God, we pray your blessing and give you thanks. We pray this day for your world, aching as it is in labor pains, oh God, we pray that we might trust that these present difficulties are leading to glory, are leading to liberation and self-determination and peace, oh God. We pray for your people all around the world who are striving for all that is good and right. We pray this day for the healing of creation. We pray it all in the holy and powerful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Good morning. 
Our first reading today is from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 27 to 34. You can find it on page 3, 735 in the Old Testament section of the Red Bibles in the chair racks, if you would like to follow along. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of humans and the seed of animals. And just as I have watched over them to pluck up and break down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring evil, so will I watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall no longer say, The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But all shall die for their own sins. The teeth of everyone who eats sour grapes shall be set on edge. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I shall make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive them their iniquity, and remember their sin no more. May the Holy Spirit add blessing to this reading from the prophet. Amen. That was beautiful, Jennifer. Thank you. Didn't she do a good job? My goodness. Our second reading today is from the Gospel of Luke. I'm one of those number people. If you have a thing about numbers, you're going to like this one. It's chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. It's on page 81. It just keeps happening. I'm sure this all means something, right? I'm not that kind of number person, but this one pleases me. So Luke 18, verses 1 through 8 on page 81. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while, he refused. But later, he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? on earth. May the Holy Spirit add blessing to this reading from the Gospel. Will you pray with me and for me as we move into the Word together? Holy God, bless the speaking and the hearing of these words, that our faith might be renewed to persevere being your people seeking justice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friends, I am so full. I am exhausted, but I am so full. Having attended our first in-person regional assembly in four years, I have been filled up with hope, with ideas, with wisdom shared by our speakers and others I had the chance to catch up with this weekend. Such a state makes me want to pre-teach, preach and teach, teachably preach. Our scriptures are clearly offering us a lesson, more than one perhaps, in perseverance and hope and humility. But every opportunity to explore scripture can also be an opportunity to learn about how to explore scripture. And I want to do just a little bit about that today. One of the things I find people enjoy when they come to a disciple's church 
after perhaps having been immersed in a more rigid tradition, is the way we hold scripture lightly, with interest and delight and openness to wonder, but also with courage and even occasionally cheekiness. That might just be me. I don't know. Anyway, I'm a disciple and I do it. That is to say, we're not afraid to name the elephants in the room in a passage or to point out what is not said. We're not afraid to imagine beyond the words on the page, and we're dedicated to both wondering about the impact be the lesson might have had on its original, in its original context, and applying it appropriately to our own circumstances. This is to say scripture is not an idol for disciples. We can examine it, ask questions of it, challenge it even, and laugh along with it when appropriate. Can I get a whoop whoop for Jonah from those of you in Bible study? We had such a good time, y'all. She join us next week, but it won't be as fun. I'm just saying. I give thanks for all of this, for this disciples approach to scripture. So the first tool I want to introduce today is the idea, and this is something some places might not want you to do, the idea of noticing contradictions. Sometimes people read scripture passages that have obvious contradictions, and it's done with this unspoken consensus that we shouldn't say anything out loud about the fact that what we just read is telling us two opposing things. Now, Often, these contradictions resolve themselves in the wonderful grace of the both and, where multiple things that seem like opposites can all be true at the same time. But sometimes the contradictions stubbornly remain as a reminder to us that faith is never cut and dry. I will leave it to you to decide which way today's contradictions go. In our gospel passage, the narrator sets up Jesus' parable by saying he was teaching them about their need to pray always and not lose heart. But at the end of the passage, Jesus contrasts God with the unjust judge by saying that God will quickly grant justice. So which is it? Are we in for a long slog demanding heroic levels of persistence in prayer? Or is God going to be right here, ready to answer the moment we call? Is this one of those mysterious and annoying instances of God's time? Can it help us trust that our perseverance is going to pay off any moment, any moment now? In the passage from Jeremiah, there is another small instance of a slightly mixed message. God says that there's going to be a new covenant. We brace momentarily for a different set of requirements, a new version of the terms of agreement. But it turns out that God is talking about that same old covenant of the Israelites being God's people. It's just that this time God says they're not going to break the covenant, right? I want to pause here with that Jeremiah passage and interject another thing to watch for when reading scripture. Perhaps the most important thing we can keep in mind when reading the Bible is to watch for what it is telling us about God. And do you hear it there in those words from Jeremiah? Do you hear the passionate longing in God's voice for a covenant that the people won't break. For faithfulness, the likes of which has not yet appeared within humanity. It's almost heartbreaking, this unrequited desire of God to be in relationship with God's people. So often, we describe God as loving or powerful or forgiving or creative, but longing? Can you imagine what it would be like to be in relationship with a longing God? To know in your bones that God's greatest desire is for us to be in faithful relationship with God. So I just let that sit. 
sink into your soul for a moment. God longs to be in faithful relationship with you, with us. All right, now we're going to get back into teaching mode. This next tool is a little more technical. I even made a diagram. Not going to make you draw it for yourself like our teacher did at Regional Assembly this weekend. Unless, if you were to jot it down and keep it, it could be a fruitful thing to do when you're reading scripture on your own. question we're going to look at is who are all the people in this story? And this is a question you can apply to almost any passage. Who are all the people? And our method here suggests that most of the time they are, there are layers of people to identify. For a passage like we read today in Luke, we'll start with the most obvious layer, the characters in the parable. In this instance, that includes the unjust judge, who neither feared God nor had respect for people, and the widow seeking justice. This story is primarily about the dynamic of pestering and eventual relenting that is going on between the two of them. The next layer in this story is found around the edges of the passage in Luke. Jesus and the disciples, or whoever his audience is, uh, or from Jeremiah, God, and whoever is listening to God. Now, it's important to remember that this layer is actually two, because Jesus' audience, right from the story and in the background, in the background, there is the gospel writer and the gospel writer's audience. It may be that Jesus' disciples needed a lesson in perseverance, but it's even more likely that Luke's congregation needed assurance that God had not abandoned them. These same dynamics, of course, are also present in the passages we read from the prophets, as we are learning in our Bible study this fall. There are the various people the prophet is prophesying about, and there is the prophet's audience, right? And the redactor's audience. Now, we could spend a lot of time on this double layer, but I want to move on to the next one. You would think the circles would keep moving outward, wouldn't you? But it didn't, did it? The next layer is actually in between that inner circle, the red one there, of the characters and the double layer of the one telling the story in the audience. One of the most important things to look for when in scripture are the invisible characters. Because they will lead us to important questions. And they may fill in gaps that have kept us from fully receiving the story as relevant to our lives. <clears throat> Many, perhaps most of us, have never had to repeat, repeatedly plead. That's hard to say. Why did I write it that way? Everybody say repeatedly plead. Repeat, yeah. repeat. It's hard, right? Okay. You're going to give me a break here, right? Most of us have never had to repeatedly plead with a judge for justice. Most of us will never be in the position of that judge. So who are the invisible people in this story? Certainly there is the opponent the widow mentions. But another question is who on earth made this terrible man a judge? The story is very clear. It says it twice. He had no fear of God and no respect for anyone. So why would anyone think he was an appropriate person to issue judgments on God's people? How did he come to have this power? Judges are not warriors who claim their authority by <laughs> conquering others. They are appointed or elected or named by someone else. <laughs> As we approach an election in a system where we are invited to vote for judges who we often know little about, we may find ourselves most readily in the position of some of the invisible characters in this story. When we turn to Jeremiah, and even as we read the book of the Twelve, the so-called minor prophets, we do well to look again for the invisible characters. 
So often the prophets are commentating about God's relationship with God's people, as in this passage from Jeremiah. Too often that leads us to imagine the people as one unit, a monolith behaving the same way. And yet, there is usually a clear distinction drawn by the prophets. There are the people God is upset or disappointed in, the ones who are in charge, who have authority over the lives of others and are frequently neglecting to care for the vulnerable and the poor. And then there are the vulnerable and the poor. They are all God's people, but they are not all guilty. One portion of God's people are the victims of the others. And it's clear who God is interested in defending. When this distinction is not obvious, it's important that we make it plain. We must make these characters, these separate peoples, plain. No longer will there be teachers, God says. People who have authority over others, people like me, because we supposedly have better knowledge of God's will. Instead, everyone will know me, God says. Everyone will be an authority on my forgiveness and love. We need to find those invisible characters and the distinctions that make them different, the distinctions that make them different from one another, so that we know who to identify. The last layer of the people in any given story from the Bible are those who are farthest removed. That layer, of course, is us. We are part of the story. It is vital that we remember that we are distant from the center. There are chasms of cultural and historical differences that mean we must take care when inserting ourselves into the story, but it is for us also. God has invited us to know divine grace and love, to have that wisdom housed in our hearts as well. God is longing for our faithfulness. God wants to grant us justice. But as we look at these stories of persistence, humanities and gods, we have to ask, who is waiting on whom? We may feel like the persistent widow seeking justice that has not yet arrived. But what if we are, in fact, those invisible ones who have propped up the unjust judge? What if we have also broken covenant with God? Are we waiting on God to act? Or is God waiting on us? We know that God's faithfulness will not fail. The question Jesus leaves us with is about our own. May we answer the call with perseverance and hope. Hallelujah. Our hymn of response this morning is number 658, Restless Weaver. It is at this time that we invite forward anyone who wishes to join with this community by transfer of membership from another congregation or by making that first good confession of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It is at this time that we are all invited to rededicate our hearts and our lives to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Will you stand with me as you are able and join in singing our hymn of response? Thank you.
Hi, everybody. In the program that I'm currently going through that will be done in the middle of next year, um, I have had to do a couple of exercises so far, and they seem similar, but they're not. One is my faith trajectory, and the other one is my testimony. And it has been interesting since I started this program late last month, how thin the veil has been. That all of a sudden, all of these opportunities and this is what it looks like and this is what it means for me have come to the fore. And one of the things, as I was thinking about this operatory last night, actually yesterday afternoon, I stayed there almost three hours, was exactly this. You know, if you were to um, find the places where uh, I have my biggest vices, you're not going to see me at a racetrack. You're not going <laughs> to see me at a card hall. You are not going to see me in one of those underground cool bars and gas lamp center. You're going to find me at the Golden Corral in El Cajon. <laughs> it's all you can eat. And they don't have Wi-Fi, but I have Wi-Fi, and so I can work there and get roast beef and meatloaf and fried fish and banana pudding and, and, and. And so I go there, and it's amazing. And I live alone, as you all know. And there's something about sometimes being together alone or being alone together where me meets up with we. And yesterday, that was one of those times. I had gone and I, I had my laptop case and I had my purse and, I, and it was a long line. I figured I was getting there at three, I'd just zoom right in. No, I waited for a good 25 minutes for the privilege of eating roast beef from Golden Corral. And all the time there, there was a little puppy dog of a boy. He was tall but skinny. And um, he saw me talking to the family in front of him, and so he started talking to me. He's from Minnesota. He's here for a month. It's the first time he's ever been to California, and he's living in Hillcrest. <laughs> and at first, it's like I, I, I was checking my email, and I, and I didn't want, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be disturbed. And so I was listening. I was, I was giving him one sentence answers. Are you from Are you from San Diego? Yes. Do you live around here? Sorta. And he was telling me his story. And he, I'm just like, okay, okay. This can wait. It can wait. And then I found out he is he is a he is a supervisor at at near at a, at a Starbucks near his college. And this is a big deal. Um, this was the place where he came out to himself. And then he decided he wanted to take it the size of San Diego County. And one of the things we don't have in Minnesota is a golden corral. So that he went all the way from Hillcrest to El Cajon so that he too could eat mediocre meatloaf. <laughs> and he was right behind me. And so I started thinking about all these things that I've been learning. And at first when I was thinking, oh, I know all this stuff. This is going to be an easy peasy nine months, right? Not so much. Not so much because I had to remember the things that I have taken for granted in my, as you, as you see through my faith trajectory, 45 year history of being a professed believer. And I thought about this. And then I, I, when I left the Golden Corral three hours later, they were wondering just how many cups of diet soda I could ask for. <laughs> I went to Target because, you know, life still does need toilet paper and there was another chance for discipleship. I, was, I got my toilet paper and a few other things, and I was thinking about the bonds merger and the CPI thing. I was thinking about the consumer price index, and something happened yesterday that never happens, which is I can usually go to a store, pick up five or six things, and I know within about five bucks how much I'm spending. Not yesterday, I was $20 off and not in a good way. Prices have gone up, y'all. They've gone up. But then I just, I think about the consumer price index where they talk about the price of meat and, and they, don't, they don't include toilet paper, although frankly they should, and how that tells us how well or how badly Americans as a whole are doing. And then I started thinking about 
the discipleship index, how we as a community do, not just as a denomination, not even just this church, but who we are as we go out there. When I was at Target, down in Rosemont Center nowadays, downstairs is all self-service. And I always say as I walk past self-service, my self-righteous self. Self-service hurts workers! And I, I don't say it loudly, but I do say it. And the girl was, I said, is this the only way that I can get my, uh, and she goes, and she looked at me, and I looked at her, and she said, aisle number four is open. And so she and I, eye to eye, she rang up my toilet paper, and she rang up my yogurt, and a couple of other things I forget, but she rang them all up. She handed me the bag, and she said, thank you. Discipleship does not always happen within these four walls. But this is where we get the strength and the stamina to remember the people who are in the white spaces who don't get talked about. No one's going to talk about the 19-year-old kid from Minnesota who came out here to tell himself the truth about his own life. No one's going to talk about that cashier. Vons and Albertsons and Kroger's and Food for Less are going to have lawyers and mergers, people and bankers, but they are not going to have the woman who asks you paper at that table, and we will see it. Our lives are about contracts. Our lives are about promises made to people who we don't even know we've made promises to yet. But our promise to God first means that those promises stay extant. And this is the place where we learn to fulfill and honor them. Will the deacons receive the honor? time in these plates and in the lives of all of these individuals, your church, these show that we aspire to make true the vision set forth of the what the world could be by the psalmist who declares in the 65th Psalm, you visit the earth and water it, you greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You crown the year with your bounty, your wagon tracks overflow with richness, the pastures of the wilderness overflow, the hills gird themselves with joy, the meadows clothe themselves with flocks, 
The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. May you, O Lord, help us to make the aspirations of this offering today work toward the aspirations expressed by the psalmist. In his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I cannot uh, purport to be an expert <coughs> in Russian literature. But I'm fairly certain it's in the Brothers Karamazov that Dostoevsky, right? Somebody help me out here. Thank you. I need you right now. Writes about a, a woman who was a terrible, terrible person. <coughs> she was a, she just she had no redeeming qualities. And she died. And so the question was, was she going to get into heaven? And they went through, and you know, you heard, God really, really wants to make this work. You know this, my friends. And they're going through the list, and they found that one time, this woman had given her neighbor an onion. <laughs> and so they were like, we can, we can use that onion. We can use that onion and pull that woman up to heaven with the onion. I'm pretty sure what happens is she's actually like, that's my onion, and grabs it, and, well, yes, so, gravity. Uh, but that is just, just how badly God wants to make this work, my friends. And we come to this table, and you, we, we heard from Jeremiah about a new covenant, one that the people will not break this time. And we come to this table, and we hear Jesus telling us about a new covenant in my blood, and Here's the thing, we come to this table where we are fed, and I, I begin to wonder, did God figure it out? Did God figure out how to make a covenant with us that we cannot break? Because God knows, because God made us this way, God knows that we have to eat. Do you see the trick there? Is it possible that simply because of our need to eat, God will consider us participating in the covenant just enough, just enough to pour forth that abundant grace and mercy and love that is welling up in God's heart even now. Now, we obviously should not aspire to do the bare minimum of being hungry, my friends. That is not what I am encouraging here today. What I am saying is that we all have moments when we aren't being very faithful, and yet we continue to eat what has been provided by the creator of the heavens and the earth. And at this table, Jesus has told us that it is the, that is the covenant. That is the new covenant of love. We come and we remember that he took bread. This bread is, is whatever you eat on a regular basis. It may not be bread. It, heck, it might be coffee for some of you. I don't get it, but I know that you love it, and that's lovely. I love that for you. He took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it. There is brokenness in the middle of this broken covenant. He broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. He gives it to us saying, this bread is my body broken for you. Does he say, also be broken like me? No, all he says is, eat of it, all of you, and remember me. And in a similar way, he took up the cup, and having given thanks, he poured it out for them, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Pour it out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and remember me. And so we come and we eat the broken bread, and we drink of the cup that has been poured out, and we know and remember the forgiveness of God, each of us in our own hearts, and together.
as a community. Let us pray. Oh Lord our God, we give you thanks that you provide wheat for bread and grapes for wine. That you have prepared your son to come and save us and to invite us into your living covenant. So that every time we feel hunger, we remember we are united as a family. Open our hearts as we peel back the aluminum on these little cups to keep us open to your will and our need, our daily need to rely on you, to be your children who have minds and hearts that are fed by your love, your forgiveness, and our faith in your son who came and taught us to pray, saying, Our Lord, Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts to come to the table by singing our communion hymn number 392.
invite you to stand as you are able now and join me in singing the song that reminds us just how much persistence may be required of God's people. Will you join me in singing number 630, We Shall Overcome, verses 1, 3, 5, and 6. Hey! <laughs> 